One of my favorite topics, disclosure usability. So the usability of proxies has been dramatically enhanced over the past five, 10 years. It's been really remarkable to witness, so heartwarming. It's so much easier to find what you're looking for, to learn what you seek at a glance for so many proxies that companies draft. But are shareholders even reading them? Today, I'm Zippy Point. Quick Zips by Zippy Point. Quick and dirty. I'm Brock Romanek, I'm a big fan of use. So it always surprises me how little we actually know about how shareholders actually read the proxies that companies slave at putting together. So much of our online activity is tracked by those seeking to sell us stuff, to market to us, that you would think there would be more data, more metrics about this important topic, especially from the SEC. They'd be looking into it to better craft their regulations and their rules. Because if companies knew what shareholders preferred, they could fine tune what they're disclosing. Since I really don't have any information about how retail shareholders review proxies, I can't even really speak to that topic. I really don't have any idea, other than in my own capacity as a retail shareholder, where I get the proxy. Actually, I look at it a little bit since I'm in this field, but otherwise it would be toss, right? Whether I got it electronically or in paper. But we do have some information, some anecdotes about how institutional investors review these, what their behavior is like. It's perhaps best to set the table and understand how institutional investors make their voting decisions. Most of the bigger ones have proxy committees, sometimes referred to as a corporate governance team, and there might be layers sort of in this process. There might be a proxy voting group, which reports up special issues to a proxy oversight committee, which is a group of people that work at the investor who make the ultimate voting decisions, you know, override their policy for some reason if there's a conflict. These people are not the same as portfolio managers. Those are the people that make the actual investment decisions for that investor. There's a, so there's a split in responsibility here. The portfolio managers make the investment decisions. They make the investor lots of money or lose the investor lots of money. And they're typically higher paid people. These are analysts. And they have some real power within their organization. In contrast, the proxy committee folks and the staffers who work for them, have they're the ones who have to slug through the proxies and read these things. And they have to compose the voting policies that the investor has. And then when they're reviewing the proxies, they're re reviewing them compared to what their voting policies are. This job is a hard job, a real slog, because it, for companies that have a 12, 31 fiscal year end, obviously they're filing and delivering their proxies all in about a one or two week period. And so those Investors that are investing in thousands of companies have the responsibility to review hundreds, if not thousands, of proxies and make their vote, voting decision each year in this narrow band of time. Not much time for sleep. <laughs> Definitely no time for fun. These people are not as highly paid as their portfolio managers. They don't make, you know, they're a cost center. They don't make the organization money, at least directly. So they tend to have less power within, within the investor umbrella. So I just wanted to give you a sense of the dynamic here within an institutional investor. The people making the voting and investment decisions are purposefully separated to eliminate any potential conflict of interest in the voting process. So it's gonna depend on each institutional investor and the circumstances of what their policies are that year. But you know, loose average is that a staffer, so a lower level staffer, if the investor is big enough or has enough people in the department to have lower levels, might spend 20 minutes reviewing the proxy, maybe more if there's big stuff growing, brewing at that company, particularly as it relates to the issues that that investor cares about, and maybe quite a bit less if there's not. And also perhaps less if it's that period of time when there's that big crush of all the proxies coming in at once for the 1231 companies. Then that company might garner a maximum of five minutes worth of discussion during the meeting in which the proxy committee committee of members are, are meeting to discuss and make an actual decision about how to cast the votes for that company's annual meeting. Five minutes, that's it. It could be lower than, you know, often it's probably less than that. Sometimes it might be more. As you would imagine, it's really hard to read an entire proxy in 20 minutes. That would be next to impossible for almost any of the proxies out there. So it's not surprising that Donnelly Financial Solutions DFIN, known as RR Donnelly back when it conducted this survey of how institutional investors review proxies back in, I think it was 2013, ahead of the 2014 proxy season, found that only 6% of institutional investors said that they re review an entire proxy. 60% said they skipped to the sections that they want to review. 
with the proxy summary, the cDNA summary, and the cDNA being the most commonly reviewed sections. And 12 percent said they didn't read the proxy at all, according to that survey. I should note that some investors noted during the survey process that some graphs seemed a bit over-engineered, complex, and poorly labeled, simply difficult to follow. So proxy design doesn't necessarily mean that you just stick anything you can into a graphic. If the graphic's not doing its job properly, then you should be putting that in a graphic or you need to redesign your graphic. So I'm gonna end here by giving a plug for my favorite innovation in some proxies, including an index with links to the various sections in a proxy. So this would index is in addition to a table of contents. It really it makes it really easy to navigate through the proxy. The SEC should mandate the inclusion of these indexes. And so here's an example from Cognizant's 2020 proxy. And then I also like how some companies highlight what is new or notable in their proxy statement. And here's an example from Southern Company who put this new notable section at the bottom of its table of contents. Note I have a few dozen vid guides about proxy design. You can go to zippypoint.com to see those or search YouTube with the hashtags of hashtag proxy design, hashtag zippypoint. Mm -hmm.